Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Leadership Briefing. It is great to be together once again. Thank you for taking the time. We are going to have a big day today, so we're going to get right into it. Let me just review with what, what we're going to be covering today. First of all, we're going to be introducing the four pillars as we always do. It's the, thing we, the things we rally around here at the National Leadership Briefing, but we're going to shake it up a bit. People are always saying, Doug, we got to keep it fresh. I hear you, so we're going to keep it fresh today. I'm actually going to introduce the four pillars to you by sharing with you excellent excerpts of a training session that I did this past month and where I introduced issues to a group of people and then closed with the introduction of the four pillars. So I'm going to share some of that information with you and, and pieces of that training with you. Then we're going to go directly into some training of our own. We're going to be going over to the smaller boardroom here because I want to talk to you about uh, something that we always say on the National Leadership Briefing that as issues come up, and the things that we need to pay attention to, the things that we need to address and respond to. We always say that we want to address them and respond through the lens of the pillars that we rally around. Well, that language through the lens is what I'm going to describe for you today with a very important thing that's occurring right now, which has to do with our second pillar. And that is that it is the, uh, that is it important that we elect representatives to government that respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. So we're gonna take a look at a current situation that's happening right now, and we're gonna look at it through the lens of that second pillar. Okay, that's the second thing we're gonna cover. Then we're gonna go into the boardroom, and on the last briefing, you know I promised you that we're gonna be introducing a brand new training template today. So we're gonna be going into the big boardroom, we're gonna be showing you the that big training template that we used to work on. We're gonna start there, and then I'm gonna unveil the new one. So you're going to have an opportunity to see that again. And then finally, wow, I'm saving the best for last today. It's going to be like a nice, cool breeze blowing through the National Leadership Briefing because today we have information that Faye Teen from For My Canada is going to be sharing with us. We've got a great video to share and Faye Teen herself is coming on the National Leadership Briefing. So stay tuned for that. And, but let's get started. We're going to move right into the excerpts from a training session that I did just this past month, it starts out, I'm gonna introduce the issue to you and then in this training session, and then I'm going to be rolling into the introduction of the four pillars. So enjoy, and then the next time we, after the video, we're gonna come back and I'll be over in the small boardroom and we will get moving from there. Well, uh, just real quickly here, because I know it's been on people's minds, um, uh, the, a couple of comments about the federal election. I'm not going to talk a whole bunch about it, but I just want to say to, uh, to anybody who came out of it disappointed or concerned that uh, my view is that it was never about winning on E-Day, ever. It was only ever about raising the level of influence that we have in the process of selecting the government, which you guys did huge all across Canada. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. Another thing I want you to know about the election is that our work was not finished on election day. As a matter of fact, it only began whenever there's an election in Canada, whenever there's an election at any level of government, it always creates incredible opportunities in so many areas. And oftentimes, what we'll do is we'll do one of two things. When we win, we disappear into the night and go, oh, that was great, fantastic, see you in four years. And when we lose, we disappear into the night and say that was terrible. But what we miss is all of the opportunities that are opened up when things change in the electoral system. We have all kinds of new members of parliament that are on Parliament Hill that we can establish relationships with. And I'm talking about real relationships, not those phony baloney ones where you show up and you go, this is what I want, and you pound your fist on the desk and you say, this is my belief and this is I want my, uh, be, to be respected. None of that. I'm talking about genuinely thanking and honoring and caring for the person who has sacrificed much to sit in that chair even if they don't wear the color you support. So that's one of the opportunities. So fair warning this morning for those who know me, I may mention politics and government at some point. If we could start with the first slide, so we're clear on why it is that, we, why would we talk about politics and government? Because civil government, which is established through processes that are political, has the power to make decisions that are gonna impact the lives of our neighbor in either a positive 
or a negative way. And I'm gonna say that again because that is critical for you to know that I'm not a guy standing up here that's gonna lay down some kind of a plan so we can all have a rally and party one day because we won. That's not why we're here. We wanna accept and understand that civil government which is established through processes that are political, that's why we don't shy away from the political process. That's how we get our civil government. But they have the power, once they're elected, to make decisions that are gonna impact the lives of, the neighbor, of our neighbor in either a positive or negative way, and we wanna be there to have influence on those decisions. I am called to care for my neighbor, and so are you. You're called, in fact, to love your neighbor in a way that is compassionate, a Jesus kind of love. And, and it was actually here last year when Dr. Hill spoke, when I had an opportunity for this massive light to go on over my head, when he defined the compassionate love that Jesus was talking about when he, it, for us. And I have taken that, that's, that's been embedded in me, and that is my definition. Now, what he said was, is he said that when you have a sympathetic consciousness of the distress of others like Jesus had, and you couple that with a sincere desire to alleviate that distress, that is compassionate love of Jesus, which you all have inside of you. And so for you to look at this political spectrum and go, ah, that's not for me, then you're not looking at the guy next to you. You're thinking about yourself, right? All right, so here are my goals with the workshop today. First is to establish a relationship with you that will continue beyond today and that adds value to what you're already doing. The second goal of the workshop today for me is to help you understand better your responsibility and the God-given authorities that you possess right now. You don't have to go out and get them. You already have them in the realm of politics and government, and three, to share with you a path where you can learn to raise your level of influence on the decisions that civil government is gonna be making. And the things that we're gonna cover in the, in the short time that we have here today is, number one, I'm gonna expose you to some real-time realities or real-time examples of the tactics and strategies of those people out there who do not share your views and values. These people do not want you to have influence and they actually want to entomb you, if I can use that word, inside your church. This is why today's workshop is called How to Entomb the Christian Inside of Their Church. Now that's not us contuming ourselves, it's their plan. And I want it to just be really clear, they are all in. They are all in. I've met them. I've looked in their eyes. And like I say, they're a minority, but they are 100% committed to entombing you and your church. So let's take a look at what the definition of entomb is so that we're, uh, so that we're clear on this. When, when somebody wants to entomb something in something else, first off, the verb is to place a dead body in a tomb. Okay, well, we know that that is going to be absolutely impossible with you guys because there is no way you are dead. And the Jesus in you proved a very long time ago that you cannot keep him, the Jesus in you, in a tomb. Right? So that's not it. So it must be the second one where it says to bury or entrap you under something. Okay? So, so that must be the strategy. If I'm looking out and I'm saying, these guys really want to entomb us in our churches, they want to bury us under something. So let's take a look at some real-time examples, and we're going to go international first and just take a look at some civil governments and some people that I've met recently. This is Apostle Tony Ortiz. He's a brother in Christ from the uh, Republic of Cuba, and he's the convener for the Cuban uh, Coalition for Apostolic Leaders. And I asked Tony when I had the opportunity to meet him, I said, what's your civil government like? I mean, isn't that something from Cuba? That's kind of a cool, I, I, I was intrigued. I wanted to know the answer. And he had a lot to share. And he said, in 1959, following an armed revolution that lasted five years, five months, and six days, Fidel Castro took control of the Republic of Cuba. Within six years of that date, communism was permanently enshrined in their constitution, where it hadn't been before. 
Now, the Cuban people that he, that he actually is in control of now is made up of 65% Christians. That's what the stats show. 60% Catholic Christians and 5% Protestant. And at the time Castro took control, this is really interesting, there were 53 denominations in Cuba in 1959. And today, if you go down to Cuba, there's 53 denominations in Cuba. Does that sound like anything organic at all? Or does that sound like something that's been frozen in place? And in a great way, it is. Um, a, a, an entire generation of church leaders in Cuba, he tells me, have been brought up in a culture of state domination and control. They have no experience with anything new locally unless it is brought in from outside of the country. And as a matter of fact, that's what, Pat, that's what Apostle Tony did, was he actually heard of this emerging apostolic movement that was happening globally, and he wanted that for his country. But of course, apostolic leadership is in complete com competition with state control. You can imagine, right? So, so, so Apostle Tony brought in people from outside of the country to come in and help him understand and teach his leaders, and so he understood that better. Well, immediately it caught the attention of the government, and those individuals were barred from the country from ever coming back again. They were also, that they heard uh, uh, Apostle Tony had an apostle that just kind of came down for a visit. I don't know, he said he came down for a visit. And if while you're, while you're here, could we do a couple of meetings, that kind of a thing. The state found out about that. Military police showed up as church, surrounded the church. They had armed, they had, they had rifles, all of them. They surrounded the church and they called with a, a bullhorn that said, bring out the apostle. <laughs> Can you imagine? Now, of course, Tony, he says he's got a few friends and they knew that they were coming. So they spirited the apostle away and they had the meeting elsewhere. But... He did, he did have, a, uh, he did have a, uh, a, a show of force. Apostle Tony also told me that he wrote a book. He said, but you can't write a book in, in, in Cuba very easy because you need to get it published. You need to actually get a book printed by somebody somewhere and all of the printers are state controlled. So he had to get it printed by himself. He actually participated in printing the book himself. Well, the state found out that he wrote a book on developing character, which is what it was about, and they came and they said, we need to see your book. He'd printed a thousand copies himself. And so he showed them the book and they read it and they came back and they said, we need to see the 999 other books that you printed. And they confiscated the books and burned them in the streets. He also, every month, the police show up at his door and they arrest him, take him to jail and interrogate him. Every month, once a month, it's a regular thing. You can almost set your clock to it. And you know what, Tony said, he says, it's probably a good thing that they arrest me because in the 15 provinces in Cuba right now, we have eight apostolic ministries set up in eight provinces of the 15. And it's growing all the time. You can't keep this, you can't, you can't shut this down. So now let's take it back home because we're gonna come back to Canada here. Because I want to, I want to, does that sound like, can you see that, that people are trying to be buried or entombed or entrapped inside of their system as Christians? But is that even possible that that can happen back here in Canada? Well, let's see if we can find some actual evidence of what might be going on out there that can, can lead us to believe that it is happening here in Canada. I'm going to show you a quick video clip. And this is, this, I want to, I want to, before I show you the clip, Whenever I show the clip of someone speaking, I want to make sure that we are not in our minds or hearts or spirits vilifying the person. This is just an example of something that someone said that we have to be very aware of. Now, this person may not share our views and values, probably likely doesn't, as, uh, uh, but within the time this video was shot, he could have met Jesus, you know what I mean? Like, I just don't want to vilify the guy, right? But it gives us an advantage to listen to what he says and be able to pick it out of conversations because this guy's slick. This is a liberal member of parliament that was re-elected in the last, in, in the last uh, election from Surrey Centre. He's a, trained as a lawyer, very articulate, and he sat in front of a church congregation in a church that we were working with, and the question came up from the pastor, will you allow us to say what we want to say that the things that represent our beliefs as Christians, and the room is full of Christians. 
And he uses very coded language to actually make it sound like he's completely on side with freedom of religion and freedom of speech. But listen to what he says about the laws that he is passing that don't penetrate the walls of the church. In other words, you'll listen to him and you'll go, wait a second, what he's really saying is, go ahead and do whatever you want inside your church. Talk amongst yourselves all day long if you like but don't bring it out into the streets. Very threatening word, but let's have a look at this and just uh, give it a listen. Okay, Randeep. Sure. Um, uh, freedom of religion is enshrined, as I said, in the charter, and I will protect the right of a faith-based group to uh, practice their faith freely in their, own, uh, uh, in their own church or place of worship as they please, and I think our laws do not uh, penetrate the walls of a of a, of a church, and you're free to do that. Uh, however, I will not uh, change the laws of a, or go into uh, the bedrooms of people and, and choose who they want to love, uh, but you would have every freedom uh, to preach to your congregation based on your faith, and so are other congregations allowed to do the same, and that is protected in the Charter, and that will be protected, and I will always stand by that, right? Uh, we've never gone into churches and told them how they should practice their faith, and nor should anyone else ever do that. Did you pick that up? Did you hear that? He says, I've never gone inside a church and told them how to practice their faith. But what he is talking about is he is talking about the laws that lawmakers in civil government make in the House of Commons. That's what our House of Commons does all day, is they sit around and they make laws. And these laws are the things that they're trying to entomb us under. The laws. Now let's take a look at the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, because oftentimes we celebrate this document and you know what? Sometimes, sadly, we place our faith in this document, we, which is, please don't ever f place your faith in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Because in 1982, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau had a very specific plan when he launched this charter. He gave us the supremacy God and the rule of law in the preamble so we could celebrate that. Then it went straight to section two where it talked all about your right of belief and right of freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, all of these wonderful things that we celebrate. But we often skip by what Mr. Trudeau put in section one. In section one in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, it says... The Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law. In other words, it is the government effectively from 1982 on that will decide the limit of your rights. Your rights are not absolute. Your right of free speech is not absolute. Your right of belief is not absolute. It will be the government that will decide what the limits of those rights are. And how is that playing out? Well, let's take a look at the next slide. It's, it's playing out in a way that they've given themselves the very same year they began to separate us from our history so we wouldn't see it so obviously when they take away our rights or limit our rights. They changed Dominion Day from Canada Day for a very specific reason. They didn't want you to understand and be moored to your history or your Christian heritage, because they were taking us off into a bold new place. And you cannot take a boat out onto a lake if it's still tied to the dock, so goodbye Dominion Day, hello Canada Day. And I celebrate Canada Day, don't get me wrong, but I miss Dominion Day. Let's take a look at the next slide. The next slide is another example of what is happening since the government took control of the limit of what our rights are. This is Pastor David Lynn. He's an evangelist on the streets of Toronto, was arrested for preaching the love of Jesus. He was breaking no laws. He was causing no problem, but he was arrested and thrown in handcuffs. And when he was released, he was released with conditions under the law. And the conditions under the law was you cannot preach the word of God here on this day during this time. And if you break the law, you're going to get thrown back in jail. And these are, expand these are conditions that can be expanded at any time. They could say, you know what? It's not just here anymore. It's here and here. It's here, here, and here. It's not just eight square blocks. It's 10 square blocks of downtown Toronto. So Pastor David Lynn is being buried or entombed under laws that are created by government. Let's take a look at the next slide. Everybody knows that we as an organization fought hard against euthanasia laws, 
But one of the things that really we got to keep in mind is the most dangerous thing of all is that really what they did was they intentionally, when they passed euthanasia laws, they did not include the protection of conscience rights for doctors. So that so what happened as soon as le- uh, euthanasia became legal, a bunch of Christian doctors retired, older Christian doctors. And a bunch of Christian students that wanted to be doctors changed their track so they wouldn't be GPs, they wanted to specialize so they wouldn't have to actually be a part of the euthanasia regime because they didn't protect the conscience rights of doctors. They sidelined Christians, limiting their amount of influence that they're going to have in the medical community by not protecting their conscience rights. Next slide. Radical sex education curriculums that teach that that, that kids' genders are fluid and that you can be a boy one day and a girl the next. All of those plans and programs do not protect teachers' conscience rights. So we have teachers retiring at a very rapid rate, Christian teachers in the public system, and we have a lot of young, brilliant, lovely, wonderful, fired up Christian youth that are not going into education because they know that they're not going to have their conscience rights protected. So they're entombing us. Like our friends in Cuba. Next slide. There was a there was a uh, an event here. Um, Our brothers in Christ in the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada movement had a national, an international, pardon me, world congress of evangelicals that came to Calgary. Did you guys hear about that? Anybody hear about that? Yeah. Um, There were five thousand delegates. About twenty five hundred of them were from Canada and sort of the U.S. A local, but there were 2,500 uh, delegates that were coming from international countries. And the government, um, federal government, through their policies, their visa policies, actually denied entry to 800 of them. Many of them, their paperwork was so perfect, and they had been here before, that you looked at it and you just went, it's, it could only be anti-Christian bias. Like, there's, there's no, you can't point to a single reason why they wouldn't allow these people in the country. That is, unless you didn't want them to start something. You know what I mean? They're just going to get in here and mess up. We're trying to entomb the Christians here in Canada, and you're bringing all these fights. What happens if someone from Africa comes and raises someone from the dead? That's really going to mess things up for the government, isn't it? <laughs> that is, unless the West, you know, mainstream media is there, because you know it won't get covered. You know that will not happen, right? Because no Christians allowed, that's the goal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pr- go quickly through these last ones, because these, these, this is... A, so the government's making laws, but they're, they're limiting our freedoms, but at the same time, they're opening the doors and allowing other things to happen. If you have a left-wing, socialist, communist take on anything, there is no limit on what you can do, say, print, speak, sing, dance in our country. Also, there's a massive amount of money, the next slide, there's a massive amount of money going into the uh, little tiny little death of a thousand cut types media things that make you question what it is that you believe and our kids are getting bombarded by it on the internet and in print. They're also being bombarded with these new laws that are trying to knock them offside. If anybody thinks that marijuana was about, was about just we want to make it available because we can handle it better and we can, we can take the drug profits and we can beat back the cartels. and all, No, 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 no. That's not what it's about at all. That's not what it's about. It's about, it's about placing the kids in submission, letting the, the prime minister and that government become cool Uncle Bob and, and making marijuana illegal and separating kids from their parents. That's what that's about. And massive amounts of money are going into that. They're also burying our children in debt. The, as, as you know, one of the things that this government is not afraid of is spending money. We just, ha- we just crossed the threshold of $1 trillion market debt in Canada. $1 trillion. That's your kids and your grandkids paying that debt back for their entire life. Because if your kids break free from marijuana and the propaganda that they're being fed, then they want to they grab a hold of them and turn them into financial bond servants of government. That's what they want to do. Now, can I ask you a question here? Does this sound like a, a plan and a strategy of people that are all in? Does this, is this a full commitment on every level? 
Okay, this is the kind of commitment I'm encouraging you to respond with. Because if we kind of, oh, I don't know, it's kind of late and I think I want to sleep in a little bit long, you know, you know, that's just not going to make it when you've got people coming at you like this. Now, I'm going to shift now to what I said was the, what I think is the answer to a lot of this. The key, the key, our response. I mean, it's only part of the, it's, it, I, I got to say it's, 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 it's part of the response because, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to question prayer and all of the other things that we do. But the one thing that we really need to do is come together. Because this isn't the period of time for lone wolves out there. We've all watched our kids that stepped out just outside the herd or maybe gone to the edge of the camp and the enemy is circling our camp and snatching them up as soon as they have the opportunity. We want to stay in tight. We want to come together. We want to build those bonds. And we want to rally around the things that we share in common, the things that we believe in. We want to set aside anything that can cause division in our camp and come together around the things that we believe in. And that's what the National Leadership Briefing is about. Canada Family Action, and as I mentioned last year, in the fall of 2016, took a serious turn to the right, I guess. We'll call it right. I was going to turn to the left, but I don't turn left. I turn right. And, uh, and we actually were a little frustrated about that we weren't really achieving the degree of success that we wanted. And really, partially, quite, quite honestly, out of a little bit of frustration, we decided that, look, if, if the church doesn't want to talk about what we want to talk about, then tell us what you want to talk about. And I started surveying church leaders. And I asked them, I said, tell me what are pressing issues to you, but I'm going to ask you to tell me the answer in using secular language. Please do not use Jesus said. That's just not a pro. Like, I can't use that. And I actually asked them, I said also, I said, make sure it's something that you can defend in the street. Whatever your challenge is, whatever your position is on the challenges, make sure it's something you can defend in the street. And when we got all the data back, what you see on that card that's on the four pillars and the ones behind me here, this is what they told me. They said, Doug, sincerely, as parents, we just want to have the right to raise our kids the way we want. Do you think Kim's kids want their kids raised the way they want? You guys want to raise your kids? Do you want your grandkids raised the way you raised your kids? Well, that was, that was of primary importance to the church. The second thing is, is that they just wanted those that we elect to civil government to respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. Now, I said respect and defend. So it's not okay for a civil le government leader to sit quietly by while somebody is attacking our freedoms. Passive government officials is not okay with the church. The third is that the laws and policies of civil government must provide for the safety and security of the citizens. And the fourth is, especially the vulnerable among us. That was a key thing for the church. And the fourth was that it is inappropriate for civil government to heap debt upon the backs of our children and future generations. I listened to them and I said, you know what? I'm going to do what you're, you want to do. I'm not doing what I want to do anymore. I'm going to do this. I'm going to dedicate all my time to this. I'm going to bring everybody together. We're going to set everything aside, and I'm only going to focus on this. And we are going to advance these pillars in government, in society, in culture, in every way I possibly can. And that's where the National Leadership Briefing came from. Once a month, on the first Friday of every month, Christians from across the nation set aside everything that they can possibly think of that could divide us, crossing denominational lines, I've got Jews. I've even got Jews on the call. And because they believe in these same things. And we teach and train people how to advance these ideas into society, culture, politics, and government. That's what we focus on. And we stop making some of the old mistakes that we made, and we start making better decisions, and we think more strategically now, and we work as a combined unit tactically. Together. Our unified voice is the scariest thing to the leftists in this country. I'm telling you, they do not want you to wake up. They saw what you did in this last election, and there are meetings going on all across the country right now trying to figure out what just happened. 
won the, you won the popular vote. You got more votes than anybody else on the right side of the spectrum, yet the government is still in power. You don't think that shook a tree in Ottawa? There's, there's meetings going on, but you know what? They're coming for you now. <laughs> They're coming for you. They're going to try and dismantle you, your family, and the church because you hold God above the state. That's what it is, is you're not ever going to replace the control and power and authority in your life with the state. You're not going to let that happen. Because from here on in, we're thinking strategically, we're moving forward as one, using our combined voice to raise the level of influence that we have on the decisions of civil government, because civil government has the power to make decisions that are going to impact the lives of our neighbor in what? In either a positive or a negative way. Thank you for your time today. God bless you all. Thank you. Well, I had fun doing that. I hope you enjoyed uh, that training as well. And I tell you, one thing that was very exciting that came out of that room was I had an opportunity to meet a lot of new people and introduce the National Leadership Briefing to them. And a lot of them are on the briefing today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining me from that particular training session. All right, so now we're moving on to the next segment, which I wanted to share with you here in the smaller boardroom. And that is, we were going to take a look at issues that were occurring right now in our, in our society, in our culture, in our politics and government, all these realms, we have things that pop up. And we always encourage people that as situations occur, we want to respond and address them through what we say is the lens of the pillar that is relevant to that issue. So what we're doing today is we're taking a look at the second pillar. The second pillar is that those we elect to serve us in civil government must respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. That is what this community at the National Leadership Briefing rallies around and with the second pillar is that we require, it's not, it's, it's not a maybe possibly kinda sorta, it's they must respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of religion. Those people who we elect to serve us in civil government. So when we choose someone and we support someone and they get into office and we have, uh, they, they do what we want them to do, that's fantastic. But the, the, the reason we're looking at this particular issue today is what do we do if it appears as though they're not respecting and defending our right of belief? And I'm speaking today about Bill 207, which is being discussed right now in Alberta. Bill 207 is a bill that recognizes the importance of allowing medical professionals to act according to their conscience. And if you remember back in the training that I just did at, during that conference is I mentioned the fundamental freedoms that we have in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the very first fundamental freedom that is listed in, in our uh, freedoms is the freedom of conscience and religion. So we thought it would be a slam dunk when Bill 207 was introduced to protect the conscience rights of medical professionals and the people that were reviewing the bill were people that we supported during the election and we thought that's fantastic. They're just going to go in there and this is a foundational principle that we all agree on that Canadians charter rights or conscience rights are protected and we put them into office and they go to vote on this bill and some of them actually voted it down. Well, the reason why that we're talking about that today is is that we we as a as a community we are we remember in the faith communities of Canada we are a constituency among many I always tell people, don't go lighting your hair on fire and running down Main Street telling everybody you're in charge because you're not. You are a constituency among many. Your opinions and your views and values, they are in competition with other Canadians' views and values on various issues. So we have to act responsibly whenever we're interacting with other people who have other views on things. And in other words, we have to make sure that our arguments are foundationally strong and that they can compete. Now, I'm confident that they can. I am actually really excited because I believe that the things that we believe to be true are tried, tested, and true over thousands of years. They're fundamental principles that produce positive health outcomes for Canadians. So I'm all for letting them compete. But what do we do when we, when we set it all up, we, we support these uh, politicians, we send them off, we put them in office, and then they appear to be working contrary to what it is they said they were going to do. Well, that's what happened just now recently with Bill 207 in committee in Alberta, and we had to decide as a community, we have to decide as a community how we're going to respond. Okay, so there's two different ways that we can do it. 
One thing we can do is when it looks like they, they, they vote against what we believe in after we've put them there and they don't respect and defend our right of belief and freedom of conscience or religion, then what do we do? Our response. Well, our response could be one to just go in there and grab them by the shirt and drag them out into the street and put, put somebody new in office. That is, that is the very, that's, that's definitely an option. You could just do at the very next electoral opportunity, you just throw them out on the street. But remember, that's only one of the choices, and that might be in contradiction to some of the things we believe. And remember, we're trying to build relationships with the people that we put into office. So if all of a sudden, after the very slightest hiccup in the work that they're doing, if we're, th we're threatening to go in there and like, drag them out into the street and throw them out of office, that's not very neighborly of us. We want to first, our very first course of action, I believe, and this is what I want to tell you today, is we should actually take the time to engage with that elected representative and find out what it was that were their reasons why they voted against the piece of legislation. Because I tell you, I was perplexed. I was very perplexed when Bill 207 had such challenges at the committee level and where when people that we put in there as a community, we really felt like, like we had some influence during the election in Alberta, the faith community of Alberta and that conscience rights were gonna be protected and the second pillar was gonna be advanced. And when they voted against it, we were perplexed. But we need to take that moment to, to go in there and to contact our members of the Legislative Assembly when they do things that we don't necessarily agree with. We need to remember we're trying to get into relationship with them, a real relationship with them. We're spending all this time wanting to build that relationship so that we can have good communication and so that we can have influence in the decisions of government. We want them to take that extra step and do that. So that's what I'm encouraging you to do. If you are in Alberta, we're going to look at that issue of them voting against us on the second pillar issue. We're going to take a look at that and we're going to encourage you to go in Alberta and you're going to contact the MLAs that we're going to provide you the names of after the, after the briefing today. We want you to contact their offices and we want you to ask them and say, you know what? It looks like you voted against something that's really important to me. Can you explain to me why? And then when you get that information back from them, and by the way, I've contacted four of the four I wanted to talk to. I contacted them. Two of them got back to me so far. And I'm, I am going to share in the future their responses to me. However, I want you to actually contact them yourself. And so I'm going to give you their contact information. But find that out. And then if, it's, if they violated your trust, then remember, you, is, is, you got to ask yourself, it took us a long time to get that person in there to vote them in. Should we hold on to them and work with them and try and bring them around to our way of thinking? Okay, so that's the first one that I want to tell you about today. Bill 207 for our participants in Alberta or any other time across the nation that you believe that, a, that an elected person has violated your trust. We are encouraging you to take that step of making sure that you know exactly why they actually voted the way they did before you light your hair on fire and run down Main Street, okay? Good advice. But now we're going to move over to the big boardroom because I am going to introduce to you the new training template that I've been promising you for the last month. I'm going to be introducing it to you and we're going to talk about authority in Canada and how we can raise our level of authority. But first we have to understand how authority works. So let's go over to the boardroom now and introduce the new template to you. Well, this is great. It is just like Christmas here on the National Leadership Briefing. We get to unwrap a present today. And I really, really like this present because it is a training template that is going to help us not only better understand what it is that our role is here in society as citizens and how we can influence and raise our level of influence, but it's something that we can share with others. So I want you to know that not only is the training template that we've been using, but the new training template are both going to be downloadable from the NLB Canada website. That's nlbcanada.ca. You'll be able to download both of these training templates so you can sit down with someone and just kind of give them an idea as to some of the things that we teach here on the, on, the, on the National Leadership Briefing. Now, believe me, you don't have to become an expert at this to present it because you can always just refer people to the National Leadership Briefing. You can sign them up and they can get this information themselves and they can learn it from me because I'm happy to do it once a month. Now, there's oftentimes review though, and I want to make sure that we do a little bit of review of the present template. Now, you might have been looking at this one and going, wait a second, you promised us a new one and this is the old one. Well, this is, this is still going to be around because this serves a purpose. But I, but I want to make sure that we first do a quick review of where we were at before I take you where we're going with the next template, which is, by the way, 
under the old temp or the, the this old template. Okay, so remember, these are the spheres of government, the spheres of authority in our society. We have you. This is your sphere of authority. You have within your sphere of authority the power to make decisions about your own life. You are in charge of governing yourself. These are also called governments. This is your arena of government, and you're given the authority to make decisions within that arena. You know, what time you get out of bed in the morning, what job you use, what church you go to. You got all these decisions to make. They're yours to make as an individual citizen here in Canada. We also have family government. People come together as a family. They decide, okay, we're going to decide to live our lives this certain way, and we are going to operate within our sphere of authority right up to our jurisdictional limit of authority, which is the, these lines on the outside. That's the jurisdictional limit of the authority that you have. And you are, are going to decide things like, you know, I don't, I think I always say this, like when I grew up, my father and mother had rules that they, that applied inside the house that maybe were not rules that were passed in the house of commons and were the, that were the laws of the land. But my father would say, that's the rules of the house. And he had the very, the right to do that because it was inside his sphere of authority as head of our household. We also have the church. The church is actually a form of government, and they have jurisdictional limits to the authority that they have. They have things that they like to do. And then, of course, we've got civil government, which is defined, that their authority is defined in our Constitution, the, the division of powers. You've got the actual, uh, the, the different powers that are held by the federal government, the provincial government. We've got the role of the municipal government, which is des designed and, and to do certain things locally at the local level. And, but civil government, of all of these different kinds of government, we always make sure that we emphasize that it is unique among all the other forms of government because this government has special powers that the other governments do not have. And the powers that I'm referring to are the power to legislate and the power to tax. Now, these powers that they have, we actually grant them these powers as individual citizens. On its own right, civil government has no authority. The only authority that civil government ever has is the authority that we lend them through what's called a political process. We talk about that a lot here. We lend them our authority at election time through a political process in the form of what's called a mandate and then they then have the power and the authority to act and that's what we're going to be talking about with the next template is we're going to be talking more about the authority now before i change the to take this one down though i want you to understand is is that is that when you give civil government authority to act and you give them special powers like the power to tax and the power to legislate there is a tendency for civil government to grow and expand beyond its limits of authority. In other words, the Constitution gives it very well-defined limits of authority, but the minute you give uh, government, and I'm just saying it's just the way it is, you give them special powers to legislate and tax, they have a tendency to reach beyond their limit of authority and they end up going into other areas of jurisdiction that encroach upon the family, the church, and the individual. And that's what we want. To, whenever we see that happening, we actually take the four pillars. They're, they're, they're beautifully designed to do this. They're, and remember, they came from you. We got the four pillars from you. They're beautifully designed to actually try and push back against the ever-expanding and advancing desire of civil government to take the authority that you lend them and grow and impose themselves in areas of jurisdiction that they should not be. So we'll take, for example, when you have the civil government wants to reach into the family and to say to the family, you know, we've got a better way to raise your kids. We think you should be raising your kids this way. Then with what, we, what we do is we take the first pillar, which is a parent has the right to raise their kids the way they want, and we put it right there. And we say, you know what? You're not expanding past that point, so whenever we elect of an official to civil government, we make sure that they do not advance beyond that jurisdictional limit of their authority. And though, let's take a look at the uh, let's let's take a look at the individual. When an individual has civil government encroach upon their right of belief and freedom of religion, then what we do is we take that second pillar and we say, you know what? If you're an elected representative, I am going to require you to respect and defend my right of belief and freedom of religion and advance no further beyond your jurisdictional limits of authority. Because you can see that they're doing this 
without our permission. And that's a key word to remember when we're talking about these different jurisdictional limits of authority dealing with the governments in our society. Because the only way that anybody really should advance beyond their jurisdictional limits of authority is when they are given permission to do so. For example, if a family makes the decision that they are going to submit to the counsel of a pastor, then what they will do is they will grant the church permission to expand their jurisdictional limit of authority into their family by allowing them to speak into their family. If an individual wants to submit themselves to become a family or a part of a family, then they will allow family government to encroach upon their own personal. And you know what? For moms and dads out there, you guys know, I know, is and our parents do the same thing. They sacrificed a certain amount of their jurisdictional authority to, 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 to bring a family together. You know, you, there's a compromise. You gotta, you gotta work together, right? So this is what I wanted you to understand is a couple things is, remember, different spheres of government authorities. We transfer the authority to civil government at election time in what's called a mandate. We actually want to make sure that because we give civil government the special powers to legislate and tax, that, that when they try to go and expand beyond their jurisdictional limit of the authority that we give them, we actually kind of have to push back against them by planting these pillars, these four pillars up. And then, and then we also want to acknowledge that the only way that they can expand is with permission and when they come upon come into our lives. So this is the kind of this is the perfect scenario that we're looking for and we're trying to achieve by communicating and advancing the four pillars in society. Okay, now we've taken that template and we're going to continue to use that, but I'm going to unveil now. Here it is. If I had a drum, I'd do a drum roll. But this is the new training template that we're going to be using on the National Leadership Briefing specifically related to authority. So let's take a look at it right now. All right, so now you notice a few differences here on the template. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of them. First of all, with the individual self, you've noticed where there was a whole bunch of individuals that were lined up on the bottom here just to illustrate the groups of people. They've actually separated into smaller tribes. So that's one, one difference. Another thing is, is that on the old template, the circles were all the same size and they were outside of that uh, circle there. We've also got some of the circles that were here representing individuals that are actually participants in a church. Some of those circles are inside and they're a different size. And then all of a sudden we got circles inside civil government. So let's explain to you when we're talking about authority, what this training template is used for. We can still demonstrate the transfer of authority to civil government from the individual, but where does that authority come from? So we're gonna be using, for example, I'm just gonna use this as an example because we're not gonna be able to get into the whole thing today. I can't do the whole training today, but this is what we're gonna be using in the months ahead is we're talking right now about uh, our opportunities to have influence. That's a big thing for us right now. And we've just come out of a federal election. There's just been a provincial election in provinces and we've just transferred authority to civil government. Well, the way that happened was, was that individuals in society broke off into tribes and they rallied around things that they believed in. So in other words, this group of people, you could call them, let's say the conservative party of Canada. This group of people is the Liberal Party of Canada. And they broke off into tribes and they said, this is what we believe in. This, these are the things that we believe in and we want to advance these ideas in society. So what we're going to do is we're going to gather together and use our combined voice to speak to these issues and we're going to put up candidates that are willing to represent our views and values and we're going to send them in to become part of civil government so that they can take our ideas and use it for the better of all society. But they're going to, this is what these circles represent here. And so when we talk about things like, for example, I've got Fateen coming up after this segment here, and you are just going to, you are going to be blessed by this. But Fateen is going to give us some opportunities that we have to break off into tribes and actually, and on tribes, I'm, she's, she's going to call them electoral districts or EDAs within the political structure. But we can break off into tribes and we can have influence on selecting candidates and to advancing policy and to uh, having influence locally in our local electoral districts. So that's, that's the change that was made here. Also, we, rec we had to recognize with the family structure is that 
family individuals do not exist outside the family and they are not all equal. The individuals within a family have different levels of authority. So for example, the parents, we have to acknowledge that they have a higher level of authority than the children that are in submission to the authority of parents. Because what happens is, is when civil government starts to encroach on the family and start talking directly to children, for example, like they did in Alberta in a big way recently with education, they started communicating right to, to children about what they thought was the best way for them to live their lives. Well, the parents have more authority than the kids, so the parents can push back. So we're going to use this new template. If you take a look at church, for example, people all day long can actually decide to actually go to church every Sunday and just sit in the pew and kind of hang out and, and relax and enjoy the music and do whatever. But if you really want to have actually influence within your local community church, the way you do it is by moving from outside the line to get inside the structure of the church. Your sphere of authority grows your influence grows when you do things like join in the leadership council or if you join a ministry team or lead a ministry team. When you get involved, when you become a, a actually when you, when you become a, a tithing partner of a church, you incre increase the influence and authority that you have within that sphere. I'm not saying you're going to take over because we all submit to the, to the authority of the pastor and the leadership council or however you've got it structured at your church. But I'm just saying if you want more authority within the church government, get involved and become a member and become a tither and do all those things locally, whatever it is that you want to do. But there are ways to increase your level of authority. And of course, I want to draw attention to these last big circles here because we just did this and we need to acknowledge it. I brought it up at the last national leadership briefing is that we just supersized individuals in our society during the last federal election. We actually turned Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh and the leader of the Bloc Québécois and we just, we just supersized them. Now they have more authority after the last election and we have to be careful and acknowledge that with that authority they can do good or they can do bad and those decisions that they make can either positively or negatively influence the lives of our neighbor so we need to recognize we have supersized these guys and there's an accountability piece that we need to actually make sure is there for them so that's the new training template we're going to be again going into more detail in the future but i don't want to cut into fateen's time and i definitely want to show you this next video that she's produced before we uh before i introduce you to her and uh so so let's go to her video now and she's going to tell us about the the things that we can do on the road ahead to have influence immediately so you're going to see this is like real-time stuff happening right now and here's Fateen's video and then i will follow up with her at my desk after the video enjoy hey canada well it's a month since the federal election and i want to start by saying once again how grateful we are for those of you who really went above and beyond and responded to the call to fast, to pray, to vote, and perhaps most importantly, to volunteer in key swing ridings. You know, these were the ridings that were the game changer and hundreds of you showed up and helped shift many of these elections on the ground. I genuinely cannot express with words the depth of our gratitude and our respect uh, that we have for you. So thank you again for getting in the game. As people with strong values continue to stay engaged practically with the government sphere in Canada, there is no doubt that our nation's best days of governance and policy can still be ahead. So much is at stake, right? So we want to continue to move forward. So now that the federal election has come and gone, what are the ways that we can and must stay involved? In the next few minutes, I am going to outline four key things that we can do to continue to effectively be a part of the change that our nation needs. So number one, get involved locally. Every political party has what is called an EDA, which stands for Electoral District Association. This is where the culture and the policies of a party can be profoundly impacted at the grassroots level. Political parties are organic, and that means that they shift and change depending on who is involved. Most of the main political parties have shifted to the left on social and some even on fiscal issues over the last 10 years. And honestly, this is simply a reflection of who has gotten involved in the parties and gone up the line of influence. So this is also why it is important to get involved right where you are locally. So on this point, step number one is determine what party you feel called to influence. Be open 
You might be called to help build a party that reflects your values almost perfectly, or you may feel called to join a party that does not reflect your values exactly in order to influence them with your perspective. So don't underestimate the potential of your presence to affect change. So how do you get started? Super simple. Buy a party membership. They're normally under $20 and some parties are even free. With most parties, this will mean that you will get put on a local mailing list and will become informed of upcoming local events that the party is putting on and most importantly, when the annual general meeting is, which brings me to my next point. Point number two, if you really want to make an impact, put your name forward to serve on the board of your local EDA. Not only is this a fun way to meet new people in your community and serve practically, but as a member of the local board, you can have a great influence on policies that are put forward to the party and on your MP relationally or your party candidate. You can also have a huge influence on who, excuse me, on who future candidates from your riding might be. Call your local office in advance and let them know that you would like to, your name to be put forward and considered for the board or simply stand up and put your name forward at the meeting. Most EDAs will be more than eager to add anyone who's coming with a heart to serve the community and with an honoring spirit. Number three, conventions. This, this one is a biggie. So go to the policy convention for the party that you are seeking to influence. Most parties have their convention every other year. And at conventions, local EDAs put forward resolutions that are voted on by the members in attendance. If passed, these resolutions become party policy and have a much higher chance of being set in motion towards legislation if the party comes into power. A good example of the potential impact of these conventions happened at the Conservative Policy Convention in Halifax in 2018. At this convention, a resolution, Resolution 65, which sought to put abortion back on the conservative agenda, lost by only 106 votes out of a convention of a few thousand people. That means if just 53 more delegates would have gone to this convention and supported Resolution 65, it would have become party policy. 53 is a very, very small number in this context. So that shows us just how powerful our presence is in moments like this. Not only is your vote very powerful at convention, but as a representative from your EDA, you can also put forward resolutions that you care about. So what are we waiting for? Let's sign up for our local EDAs in the parties that we feel called to influence and make sure that you get out to that, those conventions. The next party convention is actually the Conservative Convention, which will happen in Toronto, April 2020. Number four, last but not least, stay connected with like-minded Canadians who are working to build a better Canada. You can sign up for the My Canada updates at four, that's the number four, mycanada.ca, and get regular emails on what is happening in Parliament and what you can do personally to affect change. In addition to this, there is a monthly national leadership briefing call hosted by Doug Sharp, which is an excellent source of information and mentorship for those wanting to impact Canada. You can check that out at nlbcanada.ca and sign up to get notified about the next call. Lastly, plan to attend the 2020 Canada Summit for National Progress, where we will gather to talk about some of our nation's biggest challenges and work together to find solutions in the form of policy ideas, innovations, inventions, and community initiatives. The heart of this gathering is simple, to love Canada by working to solve some of her biggest challenges. We don't wanna be people that just point out the problems. We want to be people who find the solutions with a positive and an honoring heart for our nation. We hope to see you there. Again, you can sign up for updates at four, the number four, mycanada.ca, where information about the Canada Summit for National Progress will be shared. Thank you for listening through this little monologue and thank you for your love for Canada. I love Canada too. And I truly believe that as people like you and I stay engaged in the process, bright days are ahead for us all. So please share this with your friends and hey, have a great day. God bless you. God bless Canada.
And joining me now is Fateen. Thank you so much, Fateen, for taking the time to join us today. Well, I want to say back to you, Doug. Thank you for doing these briefings. This is invaluable. I'm right on the same page. Everybody needs to be telling their friends about these, passing the information on. This is a really amazing thing that you're doing. And thank you for being willing to work together. That's incredible, too. Well, we're so, so much stronger together. That's a fact. So, Fateen, you mentioned on the, on the uh, video, you mentioned that there's an important part about uh, the road ahead, and that's the fact that we need to be connected. And one of the connection points that you mentioned was For My Canada and the updates that you send out. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I'd be glad to. Yeah. You know, in this day and age, especially with the uh, climate on social media, we're not sure what actually gets into people's feeds. You know, I'm convinced that the good old fashioned email list is the way to go if we want to stay connected in a time sensitive way. So we only we only send out these emails or email updates, e-blasts, we call them, when something actually hits that as the, the community that believes in the four pillars, um, you know, takes action in a critical moment, we can really affect change. Mm. So we're not sending out emails every day. We're not even sending out emails necessarily every week or every month. We're only sending out emails when something hits that we need to activate into. And we try to keep it super concise. Mm. Uh, we try to dial it right down to something that anybody could understand, whether they're involved in politics or not. And we always give at least three easy action points. Uh, asking the question, Doug, what is the most impactful, simple thing that people, anybody out there who's reading them, uh, can do to really affect change? So we work with members of parliament, MLAs on this. We'll ask them if an MP is driving a good bill on conscience rights, whatever. We say, hey, what's the most impactful thing we can do right now? Is it signing your petition? Is it sending an email? And we take their cues in that, and then we pass that on to our email list. Uh, give some really easy direct links, click here to email oh, your MLA, you. your MP. And then we always also land with a prayer point because we know so many people uh, want to be like Jesus on this call, right? They want to start in the place of prayer, but also go to the place of action. So we're giving prayer points. A lot of people tell us they actually take those emails to their prayer groups uh, to pray into the different things that are happening in real time and then also encourage people to do the action points so it's the beautiful combination of both mm. prayer and action uh, for real time things that are hitting our nation well Fatin, i am so thankful that you came on the program today and that so we could share this information this is such valuable information for people to get obviously it's going to be very helpful to them and it's going to help them on the road ahead look for those opportunities that pop up along the way so thanks so much for coming on now moving along we got we're right at the close today but i want to make a commitment to you first of all i want to tell you that with what what Fatin was talking about there the action items that she was suggesting in the video mean that we're, we're going to have to actually take a little action between now and Christmas. So you're, I want to tell you, we don't normally do this, but I am going to be sending you one email with some updated information between now and Christmas, just a touch point so that we don't want to miss an opportunity where we can have influence. The second thing is, is that what Fateen was talking about, about registering for, uh, at For My Canada, I don't want you to miss that. So I'm gonna make sure in the post briefing notes that you actually have a link that you can click on to review her segment again, and then go to her website and register for those updates as well. So I don't want you to miss these opportunities where you can have influence. So please check the post briefing notes for that. Now, in the meantime though, between now and the next time we talk, uh, at, is, for our next briefing, you're gonna be experiencing a very wonderful and Merry Christmas. And we just want you to know that we will be praying blessing for you and for your family. And of course, we will continue to pray that God continues to bless our great nation of Canada. Thank you so much for being with us today. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now.